well, Louise, as they say, now the time has come. <laughs> it's the final curtain. <laughs> In all honesty, um, why, why leave after, you know, 22 years? Good question. Hi, Summit. Nice to see you. Um, I, I guess there's a number of reasons, really. Um, it, there were sort of two, two natural choices for me. Well, first off, I, I should say I have been doing the job for 22 years, uh, be it in three different organisations because of uh, pulling them all together and creating something quite different as it is today. So that's kept me busy and certainly kept me occupied for all that time uh, and the, the to-do list is still running long so it, it's not for want of challenge but for me it just it was a timing thing I always knew there would come a time when uh, a change would be due and uh, during the course of last year various things happened to us all actually um, but for me there was a few things that happened that just gave me a bit of time for personal reflection as well as professional um, the Institute's in really good shape. And so I felt like it was it was a good time to try something new. We'll, we'll talk about where you're going uh, in a moment, but um, let's go back to that childlike Louise who joined the Energy Institute all those decades ago. Um, when you first joined, what kind of organisation was it? I think it was still very, you know, you know, there haven't been that many female CEOs in the energy industry in all these years, sadly still. So you, you broke the mold even more so then. Did you think um, you were joining something weird, an institution that was very kind of stuffy? What, what was it like for you as a young woman and then becoming a, a CEO so young as well? Yeah, so I was I, I did a couple of years in the in the commercial world before I fell upon the world of sort of charities and, and professional bodies. I didn't really know what a professional body was, if I'm really honest, and I knew very little about energy uh, all those times, uh, all those years ago. But it was um, it was either go learn something about these organisations and, and the not for profit world appealed to me anyway. The alternative job offer at the time was to work in the PR office of a very glamorous hair salon whose name shall remain only known to me because the choice between the two, well, anyone that knows me well knows that that's not the place for me to be. So I took the other one um, and thought, well, I, you know, I'll do this for six months. I'll learn, I'll learn some good stuff, surely. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I absolutely did. But it, it just took me a few, a, a bit longer than uh, six months to, to work it all out, I guess. Um, but yeah, back at the time. You're not an engineer by background, are you? No, no. So I'd done a, a business degree and then I'd done press and public relations as a, as a, as a follow up to that um, because I was graduating at the height of a recession. So it was not a good time for graduates to be looking for jobs and particularly ones with quite generic studies like mine under my belt. So uh, hence why they, there was a, a bit of a lapse before the opportunities came along and, uh, and then they were quite different. Um, so what did I find? I found quite a sleepy organisation, very sort of focused all about the UK. It was, there was no international lens on, on it at all. Um, much like the, the panelling behind me, uh, except this stuff was, was oak um, and uh, there was green leather inlay on the tables in the meeting rooms. Um, and the women, the, the, the women in the organisation were all, all in the office, in the staff team. There were, there were I didn't meet any female members of the organisation early on. Um, and uh, yeah, when I think about it now, it was a very, very different place. And I was, I was told early on, uh, which was some advice that I ignored very ably, that I would be seen and not heard, you see. Wow, well, it, but this is not the 1950s, this is 98, right? No, but it felt, it, well, it, it, was, it was the mid-90s when oh, I mid first, first went there, and then yeah. by the, the end of the 90s that I'd been appointed the CEO, so I was 27 when I was appointed CEO, and it was a very contrasting set of opinions, because it, the early part of me arriving at this organisation being told I'd be seen and not heard... And then, um, you know, six years, six, it was within five, six years, there was a, 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 another sort of industry doyen figure who was, was quite cleverly, uh, in, in hindsight, I guess, but at the time taking quite a big risk on saying, actually, you know, let's, let's put her in the role. Let's see if she can do what we need to be done because she's very different and she'll bring a lot of different things to, to the job. When you look back and you think about energy then, 
you know, most people would probably say there was really not really an energy sector to think of in the sense that there'd been the kind of, you know, the breakup of, of the state system. No one really cared. I remember I worked at the BBC at the time. No one really gave a damn about energy or there was a bit of environmentalism. So it was kind of, it's doing itself. There's a market. And the main thing is price. That's all that matters. What did you think of that world of energy when you first came in? You said you took your time to, to start to understand it. Did you think it was still very anachronistic world compared to, for example, the digital world of, of telecoms and computers as we were seeing? And e even PR and, and, and media was much more sort of advanced in those days compared to, to, to energy. Yeah, it was. I mean, you're right. I remember the the early days were that we were just talking about deregulation of the industries and privatisation. So um you know it was the the world of the cgb et al you know was what i walked into um and and didn't understand very much about it at all and then there was this quite quite a lot of momentum interestingly around privatization and deregulation of the industry much talked about lots of conferences lots of articles uh the, the sort of the, the the buzzy conversation was all around that but you're right it was very really uh, against like energy itself quite often taken for granted pretty invisible yeah. no no sector profile of, yeah, no of, of any description no, not no. something if you came yeah. from the outside in you go yeah. oh yes i know da, 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 you know i have a bit of knowledge um but uh, yeah nothing no nothing so as somebody coming in who didn't know anything it was kind of an advantage because everybody else is in the same boat yeah because you, you wouldn't have been in the media fire line there wouldn't be all this conversation that there is today there was nothing no there. No one was talking about climate change. No. Nobody, there was no Extinction Rebellion. There was no sort of societal movement. In fact, one of my biggest frustrations in the early years was wishing more people would take interest. Now um, look, you know, yeah. I mean, we couldn't be more poles apart <coughs> on, on that one, particularly. Um, I don't want to remind you of your age because you're still a lot younger than me. But you know, you, you've been a bit, like I said, the energy queen. You've seen people come and go, CEOs have come and gone from off-gen, big six. You know, the big six isn't what the big six was. So much has changed over these last sort of two decades. What would you say have been the significant milestones that you've seen that have really affected, not just the sector here, but also with your global members hat on, that you've seen causing ripples worldwide? Oh, I mean, you know, the, the policy, the policy sort of transformation that we've had along the way, as you said, from not really, I mean, some people would still say that maybe isn't the energy policy that they would like to see today, but then we would say, well, there isn't any energy policy mm. uh, back then. I mean, it, it, it's, it's certainly been on a journey. And I, and I guess in the UK, the real pivot for, for UK was the Climate Change Act in 2008. Yeah, yeah I, I guess that was the biggie. And then, and then really, I suppose it was sealed with Paris. Yeah. Subsequently, thinking about sort of global action and, 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 and subsequent intervention. And now, now you look at the number of countries who've got net zero legislation. So the UK was first off the blocks, but you know, there's, there's 90 plus countries that have done that now. People are gearing up to COP26 in Glasgow later this year with real ambition to improve their national, um, their NDCs, their national defined contributions and, and, and go faster and accelerate the pace of transformation. So I think for me, those are probably the two biggest, but you know, I mean, I can remember sat in a, an Energy Institute event and two of the fellows were de designing EMR on the back of a napkin. There you go. Yeah, you know, we had fellows who were on the Committee on Climate Change uh, first committee and, and subsequent ones that have, have, have followed uh, quietly giving their, their advice and their guidance, you know, using their knowledge to help really inform and shape the evidence base, which is essentially what we've spent all this time doing and the EI will continue to do looking ahead. So just quietly putting its head above the parapet, trying to share the benefit of its wisdom, collective wisdom amongst the, the membership. Uh, in order to try and get to the right answer that for, for the public good, ultimately. What have you seen the Energy Institute as? Because, it, it, you, like you said, you know, green leather sofas, you know, perhaps some pipes in those days, who knows? You know, a couple, yeah, a couple, yeah. <laughs> you know, meeting room, have a chat, room is, should have a bit more coal here or whatever. Maybe that's what it was and people having theorising sort of big ideals. Um, is it where you want it to be? Has it become more of a voice of the industry? Or do you think it's still just kind of a members organisation where people talk within themselves, but it doesn't really influence enough? 
I think there's always more to do, right? Even though even though it's not going to be for me to do going forward and it'll be for my successor, there should always be greater ambition. Uh, it's one of the things that's driven us in, in, in all the time that the Energy Institute's been around, that I've been involved with it, certainly. And it is over 100 years old, so there's there's more to do. Um, and I and I think that that's really important. But I, for me, what is the Energy Institute? It's the power of the energy professional that is just so important. You know, the Energy Institute is a professional body it's not a lobbying organisation. It's not mm. a voice or a mouthpiece for the industry. Um, it is there as an independent and honest broker that is about trying to inform the quality of the discussions we have with some great content so that the good answers come out the other end. You know, we're not going to advocate for what the fuel mix should be. We're not going to put our head above the parapet and talk about a, a range of policies or market me mechanisms we think should yeah. be in place. What we do, what we do do, and what we will continue to do, I'm sure, is to say, if you take a particular option A, just make sure you've thought about B, C, and D before you leap, mm -hmm. because that's where your unintended consequences are. But that's from a position of science and from a position of informing the evidence. Now, you know, those those things aren't necessarily the sexy things that grab the headlines, but neither is that what we're there to do. So whilst, as you know, I'll do quite a lot of these sorts of things and, and, and in the days when we met in a room and, and talked to each other, I would do a lot of that too. But it's from that standpoint to really amplify the voices of energy professionals. And, and in the time that I've been involved, we've given voice, those voices look a lot different. So you've mentioned how they might have looked way back when, which is right. And there were a couple of pipe smokers that used to sit around the board table. I, re I remember that. Um, but now we've given a voice to a much more diverse community in the Energy Institute, which is, I think, a real tribute to what the organisation has done. Uh, much younger voices. So tomorrow's leaders have got great opinions and ideas and expertise to bring to the debate. And they are hungry for change. Um, and, and they want people to be, you know, they want to hold people to account for it quite rightly. And it's it's real motivation for those that are leading today to think about how do we how do we harness that talent and, and keep pulling that through the sector. So those sorts of roles are really important things for the Energy Institute to keep doing and do more of. And I guess what what would you what would I do better? I just do it at scale. I just keep ramping up the scale and looking for the opportunities to be able to have more influence in those positive ways, whether that's in the UK or whether that's in the Middle East or whether that's in West Africa or Southeast Asia, wherever we are now. As an international organisation, that's what I'd be trying to promote. Would you say that the, you know, as you say, it was a very UK centric organisation. It has become more international in the last two decades. And I think that's probably quite, you know, a testament to, to you know, we, we like to lock ourselves in this country quite a lot. But I think globally, the UK energy sector is still seen as a leader, isn't it, after all these years? Absolutely, and absolutely. You, I, you know, like, and I remember, yeah, a lot of the debates we had around Brexit. Yeah, remember that when we were all we were all debating that one that was you know, oh well what's going to happen to all of the environmental regulation and all of the environmental policies and, and energy energy policy that we've tried to work on and improve and our answer was always do you know what I don't think it's going to have a big impact quite frankly because we've always been in the leadership position there and there's no reason why we won't continue to do that and I think you know if you look at what's what's coming later this year to the UK even if it happens virtually and not, not as a physical gathering, which I guess is possible, there's still the opportunity for the UK to use its, its diplomatic service and its influence and, and its expertise, actually, to, to help others to get to, to the same place as our thinking and, and go further you know, and implement policies and, and design mechanisms that make this happen for everyone's benefit. What's been your biggest regret you feel you, you haven't achieved in your time at EI? Oh, I don't have any regrets. I guess, I guess I'd always, I, I, I don't know. No, an answer. <laughs> no, should I with the end? Yes, no, no regrets at all. But I think, um, oh, if I had more resources, if I could, if I'd have had more power to my elbow, I could have gone and done a lot more, a lot faster, which I guess goes back to this point of scale. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that would have really given me sort of uh, some ammunition to, 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 to do even more, which was so brilliant. Tricky because you, you, you have members who would have complete, there could be members of your organisation with completely different views. Someone who's completely green and someone yeah. who's completely pro-coal or oil and gas. 
and you've got to you've got to satisfy both of those because they both want membership of this organization so in terms of kind of what more could it be you have to represent what your your members want then no <laughs> That, that's the beautiful thing about professional bodies. So if you're running a trade organisation, you absolutely do. So your struggles in that conversation where you've got polarised views is about trying to find consensus. In my organisation, in my world, it's about what does the evidence say? Then that's the right answer for the public good. And if, and if you don't like it, I appreciate that you don't like it and I hear you. But that's the right answer. Which is different. It's different. It's not it's not about trying to get to consensus or worrying about lowest common denominator at all. Um, and, and rather than, I guess, sort of the, 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 the green uh, campaigner uh, versus the coal man or yeah. woman, probably the only place where there, there is a little bit of contention sometimes in the membership discussions is around nuclear, because that tends mm. to be where historically there have been those extreme views. But even now, I think there's a lot of brokering um, and a lot of building of understanding, which is part of the value of a professional organisation. You know, sometimes these, these views come out of just not understanding and not appreciating the, um, the, the content. And actually, in, in bringing people together and sharing mm -hmm. that, you can, you can find a, a better, more accommodating place for some of those more extreme views. Do you think the energy sector has matured? And it sounds stupid for a sector that's been around for hundreds of years, but I think it's matured a lot in the 10 years I've seen it because you now have people you'd never have thought advocating electric vehicles, renewable energy, all of these things. Um, there's been a debate that's brought the public with it. The public are now engaged. And as you said, you know, you're trying to get more younger members. You're going to have different people coming in who, who are joining the sector from different backgrounds. Um, do you feel that it's changing now simply because, not because it, it's had to change, but it's reflecting society? Yeah, and, and I, do, I, do, I do think it has, but I, I also do think it has to change. I, I do think, oh. actually, it is really, really important, you know, and part of the things I'm really proud of in bringing those more diverse voices into the Energy Institute and, and therefore sort of promoting the uh, the things that they have to say to people who influence and shape the energy system now <clears throat> is is really really important because whilst this sector was invisible when we were yeah. when we were talking about it in the late 90s it has to be incredibly visible now in order to attract the innovation and the talent that is needed to get to net zero we can't do things the way we used to do it with the same faces the same thinking and the same processes we have to be really creative and innovative. And that requires all the talent from all walks of life, including those that we just don't appeal to in enough quantity at the moment. So yeah, I think the visibility of the sector is, has never been more important actually to get to net zero. Um, you're off to BP and many would think that's a very odd move. Uh, in some ways it's a natural move because of the history of the Energy Institute, but also with the focus on net zero, your own personal interest in net zero, how would you say to critics who say, well, why are you not joining a renewable charity or joining a, a, a kind of renewable energy group? Why are you going to work for one of the biggest oil and gas uh, conglomerates that exist on the planet? Yeah, it's a great question. And I have been asked the question. Um, and I obviously gave it some thought when I was thinking about making the, the, the move in the first place some months ago. Um, my answer is really simple, Summit, is that you, know, you cannot solve climate change unless you solve the energy challenge. You cannot solve the energy challenge unless the oil and gas industry makes its contribution because of its scale, its, it, its capabilities, its skills, uh, its ability to finance and, and work at a, on a global level means that you cannot deliver this without that part of the industry doing and playing its part. And that's why that's why it appeals to me. You know, it, it could be easy to go into, I could go into any sort of energy company yeah, and, and, and I've got lots of, you know, there's lots and lots of places that I could go. But for me, in terms of making a big impact and, and a big difference in the world, these organizations have to be part of the solution. And I think now they want to be. 
Um, and certainly from, from where I think we were talking in the Energy Institute two, two and a half years ago about being bolder and being braver about the narrative and pushing organizations in the energy sector to go to net zero and thinking, oh, you know, would we lose people and, and, and sort of customers to the organization and beneficiaries? for our services and support if we did that we would upset a lot of people and it was a genuine worry well now these companies say to me in, in wearing my current hat can we go any faster how do we do this more quickly how do we up our ambition to get this done more 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 positively more progressively than we are at the moment so that's why i'm going because that's what the challenge is and and the appetite to really make a difference and be part of the answer is absolutely there. Um, before we end, let, let's look forward to where things might be. You know, net zero, we've had a terrible start to this decade, but hopefully the decade gets a lot better. And, you know, the ambition is there from the current government. And I think the ambition is there for whichever government comes in. Uh, there is a global shift. And we all hope COP will do something this year as well. Do you think that this is actually a very interesting time now where the pressure of what you've just said, a big, huge status quo energy company is trying to transform. They're all changing their, their bloody names, for example. They don't want to be called what they're getting and they're changing all their names anyway. But the, they need to do a bit more than that. They need to do a bit more than changing names, but they're, they're shifting. You've got the public extinction rebellion, environmentalism. You've got all the stuff of the youth now saying we want a voice, you've got that happening. You've got consumers wanting to do different things and buy different things. Um, in all the time you've spent in energy, do you think this is actually now almost like a new energy period where it is part of the conversation that people will be having, you know, that my kids will be having, and you know, that, that society is at this point where actually now energy is fundamental to how the planet will be in the next 30, 50, 60, 100 years? In short, yes, I do. Um, I, I, When I started out, as I said uh, earlier on, we couldn't get people excited about this subject. Now, what you've just described is like a perfect storm, isn't it? You've got all of these components. You've got investors taking a position. You've got yeah. society taking a position. You've got the customer at the end of the line taking a position. You've got the companies moving in a particular direction. Um, and it's all shaping up. And I think if, if governments can also then make successes out of things like COP26, but also just doing a lot more all of the time, it's not just about these seminal events, they're important, but actually it's about the signals that are being repeatedly distributed in order to give business uh, what it needs to get on with it. But that said, you know, companies shouldn't be waiting to be told or given a cue. They, they need to do this for the sake of be, it being good business as much as anything else. Um, and the investors need to want, still want to see good returns on their investments. You know, so everybody's invested. And I think that's the thing that's different. It, everyone's invested in the same outcome. They've got different motivations for why they come to the table and that's fine. And actually part of the learning and part of the fun of it is understanding where everybody's coming from. Uh, so that you make the best of it and you, 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 you find the right pathway for you. So we all know the destination. I don't think there's any turning back from that at all. Mm -hmm. Now it's just a, uh, it's a question of pace and scale and how quickly can we, can we do this? And finally, what are your, uh, I wouldn't say wishes, because obviously it'll go in its own direction with the new uh, CEO, but what are your kind of hopes and, and, and thoughts of, where the relevance of the Energy Institute will be in the decades to come? Well, it's been around for over 100 years. There's an awful lot more to do. Time is of the essence. And, and the things that it does are, are long term. So, you know, promoting and developing industry good practice. So people literally go home safe to their families at night um, from working in the sector, encouraging kids to come into the industry, grow, stay and, and, and lead in the future and, and get the qualifications, the training and support they want, or career journey, um, lifelong stuff. And, and improving the quality of the conversation around energy so that we get the best decisions at the other end uh, by those who shape the system. Again, long-term responsibility that the Energy Institute has to contribute to all those things. So 
for me, there's a huge amount to do. There's lots of opportunity. You know, we've got, we've got, as I said earlier, we've got to reach out to people who wouldn't have thought about being in the energy sector for a career before. And we've got to try and attract those people into the sector because we need all the brains to get this job done. You know, there aren't much bigger challenges in the world than the one that we've been talking about, right? So we really need to bring the best people to, to the, the problem to help us solve it. Um, it can be done. It can be done. It is possible, uh, but we need to we need to plow on, and we we cannot slow down. If anything, we need to put the foot to the floor and go faster. And have you enjoyed the last twenty two years? Enormously, enormously, and 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 I don't think uh, it would have gone quite so quickly if I hadn't been having so much fun. And I've met some amazing people. I've worked with and do work with some wonderful people um and and that's a big part of it for me is 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 who i spend my time with you know we spend a lot of time at work don't we so it's it's really important and i from industry ceos to kids doing wind projects and everything in between it's been a real privilege to be in the position that i have for such a long time so i'm hugely grateful yeah well louise it's been a pleasure talking to you over the last 11 years <laughs> i'm sure we'll speak in the future thank you so much for what you've done for the sector over the time that i've known you for sure and best of luck with everything you do in the future again thank you samir thanks